then there will be an expectation. So mm -hmm. it's likely that we as, as museums and galleries and libraries will respond to that somehow. Mm -hmm. One thing for us um, with the Mahuki teams um, coming into Te Papa was um, that when they first came in, there, there was a real expectation that we would already have a, a, you know, a significant bank of, of 3, uh, 3D digitised content um, that could be used in, in the type of applications that they were developing. So I think, um, yeah, there's, there is a disconnect currently between probably what a lot of um, creatives um, would like to do and maybe expect museums to already have and what, what we're actually capable of, of um, providing. Um, so I think if those expectations exist in most communities, it's, it's not far away that, that our general audiences will have those expectations as well. Mm. Um, and those expectations will be that just as, as the expectation is for our, our 2D images to be open access, to be Creative Commons licensed, I think that expectation will be there as well. So what that opens up um, for what the public can do with our uh, 3D scans of, of collection objects <coughs> that, that we look after um, poses some really interesting um, opportunities and, and challenges for, for museums and we, we do see already um, that artists and others are using 3D scan data um, either collected um, just within a museum or, or through other means, maybe hacking into a system, I don't know. There's an example from um, uh, two Egyptian artists who, who scanned or say they scanned the Nefriti um, bust which is held in a Berlin museum mm. and then um, you know, made those scans openly accessible through, through Creative Commons licences, um, 3D printed it back in Egypt and, you know, brought that into the political discourse around why, why museums have these objects and should they have them in the first place. Um, so that's, that's what really interests me is what, what sort of challenge will come to museums from, from the public and good, good challenge, good, good conversation and good debate to be, to be engaged with. And again, I have to preface all of my answers <laughs> with the fact I don't work in this space, but one of the things that I've found is that there's there's a couple of broad buckets here. One is whether you're looking for highly curated, specialised experiences that bring people to an institution, mm. or you're looking at finding ways of helping people take parts of your collections outside of your institution back home to their, their places of study or research. And those operate on different senses of scale, mm. potentially with different technologies. I think there's fascinating opportunities in both, from bringing people into an institution. I think there's an opportunity, even while the, the hardware is relatively high cost, to build exhibits that are unlike things that people have seen before. And that's always a draw to get people into an environment. If there's an opportunity to see something that's never been put on display before, even in a virtual sense, mm or two things to be brought together that exist in different parts of the world that can be seen side by side for the first time. I think that's eminently achievable within the next, well now, to be honest, but within the next couple of years. Um, but I think you also can consider making a lot of this content available for people however they used to consume it via standard ways of, of downloading this data. Going back to your point, Phil, um, most of us in the room have lived through the great age of the revision of the visitor photography policy, which um, I think we all would have thought would be very, very straightforward. It's just like people want to take photos on their phones, but it wasn't because it flows all mm. the way through. It's, it's copyright, it's exhibition design, it's loans, it's touring exhibitions, it's Wi-Fi, it's having social mm. media presences to track the usage and interact with it. Um, it's having charging points in your museums because people have now a whole new set of expectations. What, to build on your point and maybe some other perspectives as well, what do we need to do to be ready for this new level of interest? Um, well, Nils has to arrange a panel like this. <laughs> 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 um, I was having, having thought about it, eh? Because I don't think we really thought about people taking images in their gallery spaces really until it, until it was already until did, widespread yeah. and happening. So, yeah, I mean, being being more prepared. Um, we don't have standards, we don't have policies, procedures, processes for, for 3D, how we're going to look after those those digital scans afterwards, digital preservation. Um, as far as I know, within New Zealand we haven't really had those conversations, we certainly haven't within our own institution really. Um, yeah, so so being prepared, I mean I guess it's, but coming back to your more substantive point, I guess it's, it's using those as opportunities if people do scan within our galleries or start engaging in, you know, 
taking 3D scans themselves within our galleries or, or whatever, or using um, the 3D scans we provide in interesting ways. <coughs> but we're up for that, really. Um, that at you know at all levels of the museum, we've we've had that discussion, and we know what what our kind of position is on it, or how we're going to be part of that engagement and part of that debate. Um, because in the end, it all even if it's it's good or bad, it makes us relevant. It keeps us relevant mm. if, we're, if we're having those discussions and debates. Um, obviously, there's a lot of cultural sensitivities, particularly in, in our Tanga Māori galleries, and that's probably the biggest area of, of, of concern for any of us, particularly, I mean, uh, currently with 2D, 2D photography. So, yeah, that, that probably opens up the biggest biggest area where we don't want to see that um, those Tanga used in ways that are better and appropriate and, and not sensitive to, to their story. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting um, f friction that, that I think we're going to be seeing there. And, and we, I mean, just, for, just to kind of really see what's possible, we, we did a little, you know, like a kind of a, an instant pilot thing <laughs> at, at the museum um, a couple of uh, years ago, actually, where we scanned an object with a phone, just an iPhone, using a, a free app, 123D Catch is what it was called, and scanned a, scanned a Canon on display. Send it to the um, to our uh, to the cloud service that turns it to a model. Um, got it back within ten minutes. Sent it to a 3D printer and had a copy of that Canon to take away with us within the, you know the course of, of three hours. And nothing could have you know would have stopped us from uploading that model to um, another service, cloud service like Shapeways, where you, which is a 3D fabrication online service where you can upload your models and uh, you can have your own shop. So nothing would stop me from, from um, going and, and scanning some of our precious, really culturally sensitive, as, as, as Phil was also touching on, Tonga carvings, turn them into um, a, a pendant and sell them, you know, put them on for sale to the world while I'm still in the museum. You know, that's already, that was possible two years ago. And um, with, with the onset of, of um, say, 3D capture, that Windows is now making a standard feature, or Microsoft's making a standard feature of Windows 10 on any Windows phone, uh, we, we, you know, we can just really expect that stuff to, to happen and to increase. So mm -hmm. how do we feel about that? You know, I, I, mean, I think it's going to be hard to, to put a lid on and to stop. Um, yeah, it's just, a, I mean, I don't have an answer. But it's interesting, interesting discussion to have. And yeah, it is, isn't it? And, and the Reichs Museum, you know, um, making the highest, high, the best quality um, files they can available for their images for download, is the expectation the same? Same with three D. Um, do we want the best quality representation mm. of an object that we can out there, rather than having um, very poorly scanned versions of of important collection objects? Um, once we do that, though, the possibilities of, of you know what can be done with that that um, digital scan in the future are much much wider and greater and less able to be controlled by the museum. So it's the old debate, I guess, about control and, and freedom. And hmm. given that we're all working within a tight budget envelopes, and given that our audience represents all kinds of organisations, I'm assuming from large to small, from ones that have got digital teams to ones that have got someone who just does this because they know a little bit about it. Um, where would you be investing your time and effort, your, your time spent even just learning about the area, let alone putting in a budget line to do something, in order to get ready for, for what this offers us behind the scenes and visit a fronting? Well, um I guess the way I'd look at that, like we've been operating with no money at all as far as anything 3D is concerned and my recommendation would be just to look at sort of free open source or just open license um, software for doing things like 3D design um, and photogrammetry and then just kind of testing that out um, within the time and space that you have available to do that. Um, from there you can kind of at least sort of get a better understanding of what might be possible or what might be useful as well. Um, yeah, when, when, once you get pretty serious about it, I guess there are um, things that will cost a lot of money, mm. which um, I guess Nils 
probably talk a little bit more about from a kind of a museum point of view. Um, but if, if it is just for things such as education and that, I think that's one thing that's quite valuable is just learning to sort of navigate a 3D space within the confines of a 2D computer monitor because at the moment that is kind of one of the limitations that we have available until, th until things like mixed reality do become, um, you know, commonplace. Um, so in, in the meantime, I think you're just becoming familiar with um, just, I guess, general principles and um, how, how to interact between, you know, physical and, um, I guess, digitally stored material and how to maybe, I don't know, send some of those items to Shapeways or a 3D printing hub or if you have access to a 3D printer, um, just to be able to start experimenting um, with how to take some of those digital things and make them physical and vice versa with photogrammetry. I can jump in there. So, I'm going to do it again. All right. Um, so the major cost for me is time. It's, it's labor. So I use um, a fairly simplistic 3D scanner um, in 2014. It, it cost maybe a couple of grand. It's a David system, and it's basically a projector and a camera. And it take, it's a bit of a learning curve to it, but it can produce really good results. And it can produce results that I can use for my research, but also um, for, for teaching. And I, that sounds like a terrible thing to say. Well, we, get, we pass the, the rubbish on to the students, but it's, <laughs> um, um, but it's time. It's really time intensive. And um, this is, it, it really has to be quite a consideration whenever we start a 3D scanning project, just uh, how much time that's going to take. But for us, um, we mostly use the digital models, so we can just display them in um, platforms like um, Sketchfab and, and other online um, things. We don't need to print them out. But when we do, the, the printing for us is, it's cheap compared to buying in an, um, anatomical replicas. So, and that, that might be actual biological materials, or um, casts, um, really high quality casts. We can we can scan and print better um, than what we could buy, and we can do it bespoke. So we can say, well, I really want this frog skeleton, I want this f bone, whatever it is, and we can make that one, rather than having to go through someone else's catalog and say, well, this is close enough, we'll take that one, and we'll, we'll alter our learning objectives um, around that particular model. So um, the, the printing and the reproduction in, in that sense, it's, it's cheap but the, the time is still, yeah, it's quite expensive. I mean, I think there's this also scope to work with um, cheaper resource, cheaper resources, basically, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to engage students and, and, and schools to help with your scanning and, 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 you know, build educational programming around that as well. Because I know there's a lot of, lot of interest talking to schools and, and teachers to teach 3D to their students. And, and, and that's certainly one of the kind of the, the needs that we, you know, we've, we've recognized that, that they actually come to us and, what, you know, what can we do? And maybe there are ways where you, where you can enable that, facilitate that at, at a very sort of low level. You know, it doesn't have to be the top-notch 3D scanning um, robot system, you know. It can be a phone. It can be a smartphone. And uh, there's nothing to stop, you know, a school group from, from using a few iPod touches. Mm. Um, to, to scan a few objects in the field. So that, I mean, that's already possible, and it won't produce super high resolution images, but it will definitely be good enough to work with, to print, to replicate, to share. Mm. Um, so it's definitely, uh, there's definitely very sort of low entry barrier ways into the topic. You don't, you know, you shouldn't be scared by either technical, um, um, you know, the, the technicality of it all, and, and those, that threshold, um, so that's, I don't think, much of an issue. And the same goes for cost, because you, you, can, you can do it cheap, and you can do it on, on a sure thing. I mean, you know, Meredith's uh, talk yesterday, I don't know who of you saw that around the Mongatapu Murders project that she did. That was developed on, on a shoestring. And it's a beautiful outcome, it's a beautiful result. And, and they, you know, they engaged, engaged the, uh, I, th I don't know, it was her son or her colleague's son who did the modeling. You know, there's, there's definitely ways to, to bring people in because there's a lot of early adopters who would be keen as to jump to the challenge and be part of it. Because, I mean, we, you know, as a museum or as galleries and libraries, we have amazing content that people are, are really keen to, to work with. And we have the stories to bring those content, those objects to life. So that, you know, we have all the pieces. We can just 
it's about making opportunities, creating opportunities. Yeah, I mean, we do need to clearly identify who the users are going to be and, yeah. and what our objectives are. And I think both Daniel and Nils have, have spoken to that. I mean, Nils is, a, I mean, sorry, Daniel, you're a classic case of a, of a user with a de really clearly defined <coughs> need for 3D scans and 3D objects. Um, yeah, so I think over the next couple of years, it's just trying to be really clear about who, who those users are going to be, what the objectives are, and then working back from that to what the technology needs to be mm. to enable that, or who could do it for us. So I think there is room for, for entry level right up to the highest level and how we do that. Um, but it's, but have, so in saying that, it's quite different to how we do 2D digitization now, which is really about trying to provide access at, at scale yeah. to parts of our collections that no one sees, as we all know. So this 3D, I guess in the next couple of years, feels like a much more targeted, very specific um, focus on, on mm -hmm. particular types of objects, particular types of collections that have aspects to them that will be brought to life by, by 3D. So yeah, just um, like anything, being clear about users and, and objectives will help. Um, that brings me quite nicely to my next point. I just remind myself of my next point. Um, so I'm going to make a blazing assumption here. There's been an enormous amount of investment in 2D digitization um, in the hopes that it will change the world and maybe uh, come to wash its own face. Um, but we're spending money and not making money. Not that making money is always our objective, but we have to uh, do all the other things as well. Is there a potential revenue source that's about to, or revenue opportunities that might be opened up with this technology that we haven't had before? And if there is, should we be looking to exploit those? <laughs> Good question. I think probably definitely, but it's just a matter of whether it's enough to be worthwhile. So just the fact that 3D objects, if you were to I don't know, sell them through Shapeways or have them fabricated. They actually have some kind of utility, they have some kind of use. If you were to sell them just as products, maybe just for kind of commercial reasons, you can gain money back that way. Whereas I guess with 2D digitization, that's a lot more limited to what you can actually do with an image. For the most part, I guess all you can really do is look at it. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the utility of these, these objects is one way where at least you can regain some money on it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, I just think there's so many other opportunities beyond, mm. beyond making money, um, and I don't think we'd ever make much money out of, out of this, just as we, we haven't with images. Mm. Um, so I think there's much more, greater opportunity in to, to make museums relevant and to make our, our collections and our stories yep. known and be able to be used by people. Um, I think the experiences that, that we'll be able to create in, in 3D environments and using using 3D scans of our, our images will, will keep people coming to the museum. That's where museums make their money is by getting people through the door and I think that's still a focus is creating those engaging uh, engaging experiences and interactives that will, that will bring people in and I think 3D, the types of environments that, that Dave is showing us yesterday will, will do that and will, will make museums relevant and, and get our stories to people. Yeah, I, I think I would agree very wholeheartedly with those points that maybe there are some direct ways of selling fabricated or the rights to fabricate versions of scans, but most of it could be very indirect or even quite a, a long tail approach of just building new experiences for people to experience things in, in ways that they've not been able to experience them before, mm. to get more people engaged in this space, to potentially get more feet on the ground, but just to get people more interested in the subject, it might be a while before you notice um, any return on investment, but I think it has real potential to offer that. I might throw it open to the floor now. Are we meant to be, oh, we've got a runner, awesome. Um, does anyone have a question? Um, my question is, turned on? am I on now? <laughs> I understand completely. Yeah, you do, right? Technology fails. <laughs> Hello. Just stand up and shout then. 
Check, check. reuse and uh, store it for longevity purposes, but also um, it's part of the museum's history that you're actually creating as well. So what about the future? Are standards being developed internationally at some level that the panel are aware of? Uh, how can we get engaged with that, if we should engage with that? And, um, or should we just let it go free range, a bit like IPTC? inform some of yeah. our still images standards um, because are we creating a new legacy? Yeah. I think that's a very, very um, good question and um, I think it's fair to say that those um, standards, I mean that there's several concurrent standards, some of them are equivalent to, to I guess raw data in terms of, you know, if you think about 2D images which are the ones that retain the most sort of the most data that allows you to, to do stuff with in the future. Um, but I certainly haven't come across any um, you know collection grade standards in the glam sector yet, or even discussions about that. Um, there is a few de facto standards for three D models that we also adhere to because that's just the you know the the standards that you work with. And those are standards that are in, in turn also supported by you know, document asset management systems um, which can ingest those and, and retain 3D volumetric data. So that's a, you know, that's a big sort of um, criteria really for us to, to store it sustainably and, and, and keep the record forevermore, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to say where that where that's going to go, and and if there's going to be new standards, which is quite likely at some point, uh, and how to to best go about it. It's probably similar to to you know the way 2D imaging has has gone to reach that sort of level where where everybody has agreed on a standard. Is this an area that you're looking into, Phil, as part of your? Uh, it's, it's a really good question, and yeah, it's something something we've got to grapple with. I guess, um, yeah, I mean, we <laughs> we'll try and capture things at the highest resolution yeah. we can. Yeah. It's a good place to start. Um, and tr I mean, the principles, I guess, are largely the same. So it's trying to bring some of the principles that we know well and have developed through this community of practice to three D and see what what the differences are. I guess this is a good good first step. Um, but I'm also thinking about how how we find these these scans and. Dave might have some ideas about this, mm -hmm. about uh, getting away from, you know, text-based searching for, for these types of scans, and mm -hmm. is there sort of shape-based um, searching or other types of mechanisms that, nice. that yeah. are in development or, or coming, coming close that will help, you know, if you don't know what you're looking for, but you might know you've got this type of object, how can I find other types of objects that are dispersed in collections around the world? Um, That's great. Cool. Yeah, so I think there's two points then. That one is on formats, and I can't speak from a, a GLAM perspective, but clearly there have been a number of formats for dealing with 3D content emerge many years ago. The challenge, of course, is just making sure that the relevant metadata travels with it, with anything. I mean, we've seen that with pictures, that um, you can get very high resolution pictures, but without any metadata whatsoever embedded into the image. So as long as you're embedding a sense of scale, provenance, all of those other things that you need to capture into the image format or into the 3D capture format, uh, that hopefully is the best possible chance of success. In terms of searching, I think it's, it's somewhat tangential but incredibly interesting in that it opens a new way of, of potentially finding things based on uh, computer vision and based on matching three-dimensional aspects of an object mm -hmm. with other aspects. And I'd, I'd love to see connections made between objects that are housed in basements around the world come together in some form of virtual collections. And I've seen some early examples of that with things like Leonardo da Vinci notebooks have been brought together for the first time in several hundred years in a virtual space so that you can see them both. And from a, a researcher perspective, and I guess an educational perspective in general, that's hugely interesting. And it's something that is, is very hard to do otherwise. Finding that content, I think, is an interesting opportunity when you have 
the richness of 3D data with the metadata that goes on with it. Thank you so much for this. Can you hear me? All right. Um, and actually, just to kind of answer your question, if I may, and then I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, you, uh, Nils, you mentioned laser scan, photogrammetry, structured light, CT scan. Um, where I personally see the field going is more towards photogrammetry. Uh, I work a lot in laser scanning, and it's very proprietary software. Uh, but with photogrammetry, you're talking about um, object files, or excuse me, image files. And museums are great at archiving image files. Um, and so, so I, I think the problem then becomes just data storage mm. at that point. And then my question to you, um, and David, you touched upon this uh, creating new experiences. So I'm just curious for the museum people, um, you know, especially in an art museum, a lot of the objects are divorced from its, or it's very divorced from its site or where it came from. So I'm curious if there are any projects in the work or any thinking you've done about 3D capturing an object and as well as the site that it comes from and combining these data sets. We haven't, um, we haven't done anything in that space. It's, it's a great idea and um, I've read about projects in, um, around the world where they are trying to, trying to do that, trying to, trying to recreate, like, um, say, a destructed cemetery um, and things like that, and trying to, to bring, bring 3D scans of, of, um, of cemetery stones, gravestones, back into that place and recreate those sort of environments. So I think that's a really valuable, really valuable use case of, of that sort of work. Um, we don't have anything in, in the pipeline. And I've certainly seen some interesting starting points for trying to combine high resolution 3D scans with panoramic videos, uh, spatial audio captures of, of environments so you can put things in context and it really does bring those, it brings a new dimension to those, those artifacts when you see them in the area that they were, they were mm -hmm. found. Um, and whether that's just the area or whether that's a recreation which I've seen some examples of as well. It can be a very, very powerful way of, of, of taking people somewhere, which is expensive to do, clearly, if you build that environment physically. Um, but if you have access to the 3D scans and you can construct using some of the relatively low-cost tools a virtual environment to place that in context, I think, again, it's one of those experiences that is new for many people, seeing mm -hmm. something outside of a display case, but in the environment that it was originally used, I think has uh, tremendous potential. Absolutely, for, for objects that are, are lost, if you, if you have the physical environment, you're, you're right, the question was, you can do that the other way around, if you have the physical environment, but you don't have access to the physical object, then you can place a virtual version of that in that place. And I think that's, that works equally well. And, and we're seeing examples of that, particularly in the mixed reality space, where people um, have either a recreation of a, of a tomb, for example, um, or you can go into an actual site that has had the valuable pieces removed. You can bring those things back in a virtual sense, let people experience the space, let people experience the scale, but see those objects in context at true scale um, in, a, in a mixed reality experience, I think, again, is, is, a, is a hugely interesting experience that people are probably not uh, very used to having. So it does sort of raise a question as well about saving um, environments and cultural contexts that are at risk of, of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, but if we do that as well, what, what role do museums and others have in, in collecting that material Spaces. as well? Yeah. Um, so it creates a whole you know, born digital collecting um, problems that we're going to have to deal with, or problems, challenges that we're going to have to deal with as well. Um, I don't know if there are any museums that have a lot of large collection of, of scans yet, or, or artists created scans, but it's, it's something we're going to have to grapple with. Mm. Okay, so, um, um, so my question was sort of touching upon copyright, because um, as Mr. Um, Niels. Yes. Yes. pointed out before uh, how he 3D scanned a uh, little cannon. He was able to reproduce it. So um, my question is, taking copyright laws into, account, um, into consideration, how far away do you think is it to 
this type of technology being mainstream. Um, yeah, because um, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine around piracy. So um, he, his argument was, a product that you would get officially is 10 times better than a uh, pirated product. And then he chose to close it off with, well, you wouldn't download a Ferrari, would you? Mm -hmm. um, I, actually, I would. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, yeah, taking copyright into account, um, do you think this is a type of technology that would eventually become a mainstream sort of thing? Or do you see obstacles in that? Um, I certainly think it's going to become mainstream, yeah. Uh, and it, it is, as we said, it's going to throw up some, some really interesting copyright issues, which I'm not the right person yeah. to, to uh, comment on. Uh, <laughs> because I, I simply don't, don't, you know, not familiar with it enough. But, um, I think there's also something in, in that, um, you know, the, the pirated copy that you create of an object in the museum is not likely to have that sort of same level of fidelity or, or detailed richness um, as the bought Ferrari, if, if that makes sense, right? So you'd be able to get a, a, a somewhat crude copy of it, but it wouldn't be as good as the real thing, if that makes sense? Yes. Yeah. I think on that topic too, um, just jumping in off the back of that, like any kind of museum item has its own provenance as well and the thing that, that's kind of the thing that gives it its value, where it's been and how it was used in the past and the pirated version doesn't have that. So it's the same as if you were buying something from an auction, you could have a watch which for its own reasons may not be worth anything but it may have been the history behind who owned that watch and maybe what the story around that was. So um, I guess yeah, the piracy thing is still an issue, but the, the original item is always yeah, going to have so, so much more value, and I don't think that value is going to be devalued because it's been pirated. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So I can add to that. Maybe. Uh, um, just a comment on the copyright thing, because I'm in the room. Um, rights advisor for Te Papa. Uh, <laughs> Essentially, uh, it's a big issue worldwide right at the moment in terms of copyright law. Just as copyright law is not keeping up with the times with digital, it's not keeping up with the times with um, 3D digital as well. So uh, it's something I've uh, raised with the ministry advisors, and they're going, yeah, we're looking into that. We don't know either. And I was hoping that Rick would be here um, to talk about that, it was one of his talks, the lightning talks, because I need to do a bit more swatting up about it. Um, there's a debate as to whether copyright actually exists at all in the three-dimensional scanning, um, so particularly in the New Zealand jurisdiction. So it's yeah, it's it's not even whether is it is it piracy and or um, copyright infringement. Um, if you use this stuff, it's whether copyright actually exists to be able to say it's infringing. So there's a whole, I mean, if you're going to think about controlling, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's worrisome in some ways. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's just that it's, it's to, to, when push comes to shove, you need, you need a place to stand if you're going to try and control something. If you haven't got a place to stand because the law doesn't, is, isn't covering that area, then there's no point trying to control it. You may as well open it up. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a really, um, f not fraught yet, but as it gets more dem um, democratised and as people start doing more with 3D scans, and um, I think you'll see, hope maybe there'll be a law review, we don't know. But it's really open at the moment in terms of what, what the situation is. There's no set rules, like you can, you know at the moment with an artwork, it's death of the artist plus 50 years in New Zealand. You don't know with 3D scans, I have no idea. And I do this every day. <laughs> oh, I can just add, uh, I'm gonna have, all right. Um, just tracking back to that authenticity um, point of view. So just an example, um, the Smithsonian has their X3D site on it, their scanned mammoth. We've, um, that's available for download and use in educational purposes. We've done it, so we've got a 3D printed mammoth that we in, you know, put use into our, um, and our teaching. But I can point at it and say confidently that it's a mammoth, and that's because it has come from the Smithsonian. Um, I, don't, I don't just randomly go in and pull down, oh yeah, that's what it looks like a dog, and I'll, I'll, I'll get that. It's, it's because it's tracked through a, um, a museum that it actually gives it its value, and so that's sort of coming back to, yeah, it might be a car, 
but is it a Ferrari? You know, this I know it's a it's a mammoth. So mm. uh, yeah, mm-hmm. just thought I'd net that out. That's a really good point. That's sort of authoritative source. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Hi, I'm Susie Goss from Archives New Zealand. Kia ora tato, thank you. Um, my question comes from a curiosity about how society is uh, improving our digital, digital literacy and digital competency. Um, and Daniel, what you were just saying about uh, provenance, I guess, is um, something that really comes into that, like how do we make our decisions about uh, what we trust, digital competency and literacy is part of that. Um, so I was wondering what you all think about um, how the organisations that you work with, such as for the museums, with the schools, and uh, maybe for the tertiary institutions, the um, maybe within your own institutions, about just about the level of digital competency in those organisations in general and who supports that and maybe just generally taking the temperature of how that's going. Are we up to speed with that in our schools, for example, in our tertiary institutions? Or is it something that they still need a lot of support with? Um, All right. Um, I can, I guess my experience with that is whenever I'm bringing up printed material or scanned material, it's still quite a novelty to it. So it's still, so in that regard, the, it, it's, it's not just part of the, the meta, it, it's, um, it's still new. So I don't know how competent we are then if we're still experiencing this as, wow, that's, that's, you can do that? That's, that's, that's really cool. So um, I guess the students that I'm working with are less competent in this space than, than, than you might anticipate. I guess um, from the library, um, we've got three 3D printers and we've been running a 3D printing service for maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. And when it started out, those machines didn't get that much use, I suppose. But um, now they're being used pretty much every day, close to every day. And just having conversations with the kinds of people that come through, um, it's kind of almost like happening in secret, but you can see the digital competencies actually skyrocketing. Um, I've had students, say, eight or nine years old, coming in during school holidays with their parents, and the amount of learning that they do in that small period that they're there, um, they've gone on to win like quite large like science fairs and things like that just through using our 3D printers as um, a means of being able to explore the ideas that they're, that they're doing research on. Um, as well, um, there was, there's an outre- outreach program that um, came out of um, Victoria University, um, which I was lucky enough to be involved with for like the first run through over a 10 week period. Um, and that's been, so sur- that's been surrounding um, bringing these 3D literacies into the classroom and being able to get familiar with 3D design, how to actually draw up and create models of things. Um, and the work that I've seen come out of that and how that's going now, it's just amazing. <clears throat> There's a lot of schools now that do have 3D printers and are looking at incorporating this into part of their curriculum. Um, the teachers themselves are quite limited in the amount of knowledge that they have to be able to teach that, but it's, it's starting to really take off, especially through those sorts of outreach programs. Well, maybe we, perhaps we bookend it. Mm-hmm. So it might be that I have that tail end of the the group you know and as as I start to see over the coming years I'll be getting these people who are mm. more and more competent so, mm. so send them along mm. we'll do yeah <laughs> I think within organizations I mean we like to papa I mean there's a wide range of, <coughs> of digital literacy um, being exposed to things is a great first start to, yeah. to investigation and having the Mahuki teams within the Te Papa environment has exposed a, a wide range of staff to, to, um, to new technologies, new applications and new ways of thinking. So that's been a really valuable thing across mm-hmm. the organisation. Um, I think museums probably have a huge role to play in exposing, um, exposing people to new technologies, the types of stuff Dave shows us. It seems like that's, that's a really valid thing for museums to do to democratise that type of... Mm-hmm. Um, 
engagement with, with new technologies that are coming and being able to prepare people early for, for the types of things that will be mainstream in two or three years' time. Um, I, I don't think we do enough of that, but, but, but it seems to be something that we should, that is part of our role. Just to wrap us up on that topic, um, when we all go back to our desks tomorrow, when we're all filled with enthusiasm and uplift and optimism for our digital futures, what is, from each of you, one, one thing that you would recommend people look up, read, experience online, download, whatever it is, to get them started on building up their competency or interest in this area? Um, download 123D Catch today and start capturing your own models and, and play with it. And you'll, you'll notice that it's much, much easier than you probably think it is. I guess if you do download 123D Catch and you play with it and you really like it, um, maybe go on and download 123D Design as well and <laughs> then you can learn to just start making stuff from scratch and uh, that's one of what I found one of the easiest to use design programs. It's a really good foot in the door. And after you've downloaded <laughs> 123D Catch and 123D Design, then upload your model onto Sketchfab right, and have yeah. a look at the amazing um, content that's that's there. Yeah, good point. And it's uh, institutions mm -hmm. and other users as well. So Sketchfab. Yeah, they have a museum section, Sketchfab. Yeah. And there's this heaps of really amazing inspirational content there that that um, that'll just get you thinking of what's mm -hmm. you know what the possibilities are in the very wide range of, of things that people do and organizations do. Yeah, and I guess like the next step after that as well would be um, if you're starting to feel a little bit confident now after you've played with both <laughs> of these kinds of softwares, um, maybe download um, the Unity game engine as well. Yeah. So <laughs> then you've actually got a 3D environment where you can put things in and actually start creating interactions that, um, that people can use. And then there's also plugins and toolkits for that which allow you to use AR and VR. Um, and it's not going to cost you any money at all. So that's a pretty good pretty yeah. good start at being able to get involved with this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I've got an answer for that. Um, I think there's probably uh, a role to create some sort of community around this. Um, and perhaps the NDF board can, can facilitate some sort of conversation during the year or conversations during the year to, to provide anyone in this room or others to, to actually, it seems like we'll learn more by trying to do that, do that together. Um, maybe we can create some environments where we can, can explore some of the technologies you guys have been talking about. Um, but yeah, try and bring a community together around this stuff because we're all, as you can see, at very early stages of learning. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, have a look at some of the things that people are already starting to do with recreating environments, recreating experiences that are new and novel. And there's, there's quite a few players in the glam space that are starting to do that now and start thinking about um, what you could do with the uniqueness of the collections that you have to, uh, to, to manage on a day-to-day -day basis that is only possible because you have that data today. All right. If you could please join me in thanking our panel for today.